We're going to begin 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 1. And I'm going to do just a little review of verse 1, then we're quickly going to go into verse 2 through verse 4, and then we're going to jump to verse 14. The Holy Spirit says, this know also. The word know in Greek is emphatic. It is almost like the Holy Spirit is reaching out, grabbing hold of the readers, and is shaking them and says, know this, know this, know this, know this. And in fact, it is imperative, active, which means know it now, know it always, never forget it. And the Holy Spirit begins to prophesy about what is going to unfold in the world, not in the church, but what is going to unfold in society, the changes that will take place in society just before the coming of the Lord. It says this know also that in the what days? Last days. Now let's cover this word last days because it is so important to this text. Last days is the Greek word eschatis himirais. The word eschatis comes from the word eschatos. Do you hear another word in that? It's where we get the word for eschatology, which means the study of end times. Eschatos in Greek describes that which is last, that which is final, ultimate, that which is the very farthest. If you're using it in a nautical sense, it describes the last port or it is the very end. So if we are describing the last days, let's say this line describes history. The law came to an end at the cross of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? The last days began technically on, who can tell me? On the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 17, Peter announced that God's Spirit would be poured out in the last days. And this began a period of time called the last days. And it will culminate with the rapture of the church. Can you say amen to that? When Thessalonians tells us the Lord will come and we will meet the Lord in the air. This is not the second coming. Everybody say this is not the second coming. This is a meeting in the air. Jesus never comes to the earth at this point. We go up, we meet the Lord in the air. This is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 during which time we are taken to heaven for seven years. And on the earth, there is a period called the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, Jesus comes to the earth with ten thousands and ten thousands of his saints. Guess who that is? That's us. During these seven years, what's happening? The judgment seat of Christ. How many know the judgment seat of Christ is still a reality? You may not hear about it preached very often, but we are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is not the great white throne judgment. This is a judgment seat for believers where we answer to Christ for what we have done with his call on our lives. This will take seven years. That is how intensive this judgment seat of Christ will be. At the very end, the last thing that will happen will be the marriage feast of the Lamb. And when the marriage feast of the Lamb is finished, Christ will come with thousands upon ten thousands of his saints. The Bible tells us this very clearly in the book of Jude. And this is called the second coming. So the rapture is not the second coming. In Greek, it is called the parousia, which means the big event. This is the big event that prophets have prophesied that everyone has been waiting for. And then it begins another period, which is called, anybody know? The millennium or the thousand-year reign of Christ. But so eschatos is very important. It describes the end time, the last, the final, the ultimate, the farthest, the last port, the very end. The word himiras is the word for 
Days. Everybody say days. It's not the word I own us, which would describe a whole period, but it is the word days. And this is very important because the Holy Spirit in this verse is not describing the whole time period, which is the last days, began on the day of Pentecost, and the last days technically lasts until the rapture of the church. But he's not describing the whole period, but he's describing the last himiras, which is the word days. So we're talking about the final days just before the coming of the Lord. And the word eschatos tells us this is coming right up to the rapture, describing events that will occur in society, how society will change just before the rapture of the church. All right, has everybody got that? Are you taking notes today? All right, if you don't have a piece of paper, just hit your neighbor and ask for a piece of paper. And it says that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, I'm not going to go over the word perilous because I devoted most of the last service to the word perilous. So you can look online, you can see that. But it's very clear that these will be hazardous times, times like have never existed before. But then you come to chapter 3 and verse 2. And the Holy Spirit says, please forgive me for using Greek, but I have to do it today. Is that okay? This is all by memory. Is that okay? It says, esantai garho anthropoi. When you hear the word anthropoi, do you hear another word? Anthropology. This is the word for men. The Holy Spirit says, esantai, which is a form of the word Amy, which means I am. It describes in this particular case people that are self absorbed or self centered. So the first thing the Holy Spirit tells us is at the end of the age, people will become self absorbed. And then he says, for people, and he uses oi. Oi is plural, which tells us this is not going to be just a little slither of people, but this will be across the board. This is a general picture of what will happen to society at the very end of the age. And the Holy Spirit says, for people will be self-absorbed, self-centered. And then the very first thing he concretely mentions is lovers of their own self. Fill out toy, oi. Plural. The word phil is from the word phileo. Anybody know what the word phileo means? Friendship. It means to love. But it's always a word that is directed towards someone else, not toward yourself. For example, the word phileo was used in John chapter 18, verse 2, where the Bible says that Judas Iscariot gave Jesus a Kiss, that word kiss is the word phileo. This is what is directed towards someone else. This could be romantic love. This could be preoccupation with someone else. But in this particular case, it's phil altoi. Altoi is from altos, where you get the word for an autobiography. This is self. So when you put these two words together, it says men shall be lovers of their own selves, and it is literally the picture of people so consumed with themselves. That they kiss their own self as the highest and the greatest priority in their life. Not an attitude of serving others, not an attitude of loving others. But they are, as I told you before, Amy, self-absorbed and self-centered. Secondly, the Holy Spirit says they are, feel our guras which is covetous. And notice it begins with the word phil once again. It is the very same word phileo. This word phileo connected to the word arguras, which is the word for silver. When you put these two words together, it is a lover of material possessions. Lover of material possessions, and it would include the inability to wait for something that you want. So in love with material possessions that you do whatever you need to do to get what you want right now. And it is plural, which tells us this will be a widespread problem. 
And here, to be honest, we have the problem of credit. So we have philautoi, lovers of their own selves, and because they are the center of their own world, what do they need? They need cash, they need creature comforts, fill our guras. Next, the Holy Spirit says they are, Denise, is it boasters? Boasters, boasters fill a zones. Are you ready for this? The word philozones describes a people who are not really so concerned with truth as they are to changing the facts to meet whatever they need the facts to be. This is the removal of moral absolutes, and this is the replacement with floating moral values, fixing the truth to be whatever you need it to be to advance your cause. And the Holy Spirit says this will be a major force in the last days. And the next the Holy Spirit says? Proud. Proud. The word proud is the Greek word hooper raphanos. How am I doing from my memory? The word hooper means to be above. Phanos means to manifest. When you put these two words together, it means to be intellectually snooty. Intellectually snooty. They are in love with themselves. They are caring for themselves. By the way, this word fil arguroi also describes people who have the means to help others but spend it on themselves instead. They are fil azonas. They are fixing the truth to be whatever they need the truth to be. And huperephanas, they are intellectually snooty. And the next point is? Blasphemers. From the Greek word blasphemeo but it is plural, blasphemoi. This is also oi, which means this is a very wide swath of people. This is not a small group. And the word blasphemers describes crude, rude speech. Has nothing to do with blasphemy of God. It has to do with common, everyday, vulgar language. Now, how many of you notice there's been a change of language in the last 20, 30 years? People use vulgar language and don't even think about it. And the Bible says, just before Jesus comes, right toward the end of the age, right when we are butted up toward that catching away of the church, all of these changes in this block of time are going to take place. So people are going to be self-absorbed, self-lovers. People will spend all their cash upon themselves stretching the truth or fitting the truth to fit their needs, intellectually snooty, and we find that society at large, their speech is going to change. It will no longer be respectable, but it will be crude, rude, vulgar. Next, the Holy Spirit says? Disobedient to parents. The word disobedient is the word apathes, apathoi, plural. It comes from the word patho, which means persuadable or controllable, persuadable or controllable. But the Holy Spirit says a strange thing will happen just before the catching away of the church. There will be a block of time, the last days, when children will no longer be controllable. Now, do you see this A that's on the front of this? This A is called a privative A, and it cancels the rest of the word. So whereas children were controllable, now they are uncontrollable. Now, an interesting thing happens because now the Holy Spirit begins linking eight things that are undone, eight things which once were but now are not. And the first one that he mentions is children becoming uncontrollable, parents no longer being the authority, but in fact, children having authority over themselves. Next thing he mentions is Unthankful is a, there's that word a again, a keristoi. Keristoi is from the word keris. Anybody know the word keris? Grace, or it means to be thankful or to be grateful. But if you put an a in front of it, it cancels this. And now it is the picture of a people who at one time were thankful but now they feel entitled. They have lost the feeling of thankfulness, and now they live by the feeling of being entitled. 
The next thing the Holy Spirit mentions is unholy. Unholiness, anosioi, which means no reverence for those things which are sacred. Everything is off the table. Everything is to be discussed. No reverence for anything that is sacred. A loss of respect. Next. Verse 3, without natural affection. Without natural affection is the word astor, goi. Now, these words are all connected. Notice again, it's plural. All of these are plural. So we're talking about a very wide swath of people. Astorgoi is from the word storgas, which is a natural love between parents and children and uh, married couples. So when you put these two words together and you put an A on the front, it cancels this. So we find that where there was, a, where there was storgas, now it is a storgas. It is a loss of family love. And the next thing we find is? Truce breakers. Truce breakers, which is the Greek word, aspondoi. Again, an A on the front, spon, day, describes a covenant or a treaty. When you put an A on the front, it cancels this. This is the word for widespread divorce. The Holy Spirit prophesying about what's going to happen just before the end of the age. So first of all, we see people are going to be self-absorbed. This is a wide view of mankind, lovers of their own selves, lovers of creature comforts, elizones. They will fit the truth to be whatever they need the truth to be. They will be intellectually snooty, and from a very high position of thinking that they're so snooty, they will become blasphemous, or they'll use vulgar speech. Children will become uncontrollable, no longer in the control or the persuasion of their parents. People will no longer be thankful, but they will feel entitled. There will be a loss of love for everything sacred. Families will begin to disintegrate. Now, we're talking about on a scale like had never existed. The Holy Spirit was prophesying about what was going to happen at the end. So this is different than anything that has ever happened. Then he says, a spondoi, widespread divorce. So we see disintegration of the family, disintegration of marriage, and the next point? False accusers. False accusers is the word diaboloi. And here we have something very interesting. Because Paul interrupts all of these A, 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 patho, A, kerastos, A, nosioi, A, astorgoi, A, spondoi, and throws in the word diaboloi. Does anybody know that word? It's plural. It is the word devils. It is almost like Paul backs up for a moment and says, there are devils in the mix. And so he's telling us there's going to be a widespread operation of devils in the last day, which is the cause for all of this. And once he draws his breath <laughs> and says, there's devils in the mix, then he returns. And the next word is? Incontinent. Incontinent is ah, he returns to this ah. Akrates, it's plural. Krates is from krato, which means power. But when you put these two words, these two words together, akrates, it describes all systems out of control. Government out of control, finances out of control, everything out of control. It is a world where systems will run amok. Then he says... Fierce. Fierce is the word animeros. Mark, is this okay? Nemeros is the word for cultured. If you put an A on the front, it describes uncultured people, or particularly people who are given to violence and people who are given to savagery. All you have to do is look at the entertainment which is in the world today, and you'll understand. This word nemeros was used to describe culture, in the first century, a nimeros was used to describe the brutality which took place in locations like the Colosseum, where people were murdered and bloodshed was entertainment. And the Holy Spirit prophesying about these days just before the rapture of the church says violence will become widespread and will become very popular. Next. Despisers of those that are good. This is a very interesting word. It is the word a Phil, there's that word Phil again. Agathos, agathoi. 
A cancels the rest of the word. Befill means to love. Agathos is the word good. It means no longer lovers of those that are good. And it was a specific word. Write this down if you're taking notes. Which describe, actually it was a fictitious word because it didn't exist. An imaginary word to describe a place where there are no laws for good people. But the law primarily defends the bad. This was considered to be a fable. But the Holy Spirit prophesied and said that in the last days, it would become a reality. What do you all think of this? I think it's just amazing. Let's go ahead and go to the next verse, Denise. Verse 4, traitors. Let me erase this. It's okay that I'm using the Greek, guys? Chapter 3. Verse 4. Chapter 3, verse 4, says traitors, the Greek word prodotai, guess what this means? To sell a friend. It shows that relationships will not be permanent, that people will be committed to each other only as long as the relationship is mutually beneficial. Otherwise, they'll sell out their friendships. Next. Heady. The word heady is the word propetes. The word propetes means reckless, fast decisions, action without thinking. You can just look at our government and you can see that. Then he says next. High-minded. High-minded is the word um, Tetu, fo, minoi. Notice all these ois. This is plural, this is plural, this is plural. But this particular word is where we get the word for a typhoon. And here we have the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. Because if you look at everything that we've looked at so far, wow, it can be pretty discouraging. But a typhoon appears very ominous when it comes in. The good news is they blow in and they blow out. And now the Holy Spirit inserts a word to let us know, listen, this might all sound like bad news, but like a typhoon, it's going to blow in and it's going to blow out. None of this will last very long. And then next. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure is fill. Remember that word? Fill. Adonoi. This is the word for hedonism. Hedonism is the pursuit of happiness and pleasure as the highest goal in life. Not accomplishing something for someone else, not contributing to humanity, but living for the weekend, living for your pleasure, living for your possessions. And the Bible says in the last days, society will be filled. Remember that word? Phileo. They will be in love with pleasures. And the Greek says more than, what, what does it say? More than Philotheo, lovers of God. Lovers of God. Phil. Again, the word phil, phileo, to love. And the word theos, which is the word God. Notice it doesn't say there'll be lovers of pleasure and not lovers of God. It says lovers of pleasure what? More than. Now, here's where we have to be careful as the church because people can claim to love God, philotheoi. Oh, they're so in love with God, but their actions reveal that, in fact, they don't even go to church regularly. They don't give their tithe and their offering, but they have plenty of money to spend on their own hedonism, their own pleasures. Their actions really reveal that they are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So we need to really look at ourselves. Now the Holy Spirit gave us this list, not to scare us, but to prepare us. And I will tell you that as a pastor, I see myself as an end time pastor. I'm pastoring an end time congregation. We are living in the end times. So when I look at this list, if I know that men are going to be lovers of their own selves, 
then it is my responsibility to teach people to be lovers of others and to be servants. If people will tend to be covetous, then it is my responsibility to teach a last day's congregation to be givers. If people will tend to live without moral absolutes, then it is my responsibility to teach moral absolutes whether they are popular or not. If people tend to be intellectually snooty, then I need to be sure to teach my congregation how to be humble. And if society at large becomes vulgar in their speech, it is our responsibility to teach our people how to speak with grace, seasoned words, and on and on and on. Teach children to be obedient. Teach people to be thankful. Teach people to be grateful. Teach people to be holy. To work on family relationships and to really work that there is not divorce. We need to teach the opposite of these things. But then if you would go over to verse 13. Somebody say, well, is it going to get any better? The answer is no. According to these verses, society. Everybody say society. We're not talking about the church. We're talking about the world around us. It says, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But here's the answer which Paul gives to Timothy and to us. But continue thou in the things which you have learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the, what? Holy scriptures. This is very important. This is the word holy, iira. Gramata describes scribbles. Now, how many of you know the Hebrew language looks like a bunch of scribbles? And Paul is saying every mark, every comma, every dot, every circumflex is holy. And in fact, it is so holy, he says, which are able, the Greek says, which are innately able within the very scribbling of Scripture itself, they are able to make thee wise unto salvation. The word salvation is the word sozo. It can also be translated as deliverance through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So the scripture is our deliverance from all of these things which are going to be happening in the last days. And that is why he says in verse 16, all scripture is given what? Read verse 16 out loud. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The word, all scripture, is given by inspiration. It's from the word theopneustos. The word theo, anybody recognize that word? It's the word theos, it's where we get the word theology. It is the word for God. The word pneustos, anybody? even hear any other word in that? It is the word pneuma. And the word pneuma is the word breath. However, this word pneuma, are you listening real careful? Has three meanings in Greek, and all three of them are correct here. Number one, are you ready? It describes creative power as it is used in the Old Testament. So if the Old Testament talks about the creative power of God, it uses this word pneuma or pneustos. Secondly, the word pneuma was used to describe fragrance or perfume. So if you requested that someone go out and buy you Fragrance, you would ask them to go buy you some pneuma. Number three, when a flautist would raise the flute to his lips and would breathe air into the flute, move his fingers, that moving air would produce what? Music. Music. And that music is the word pneuma. So when you put theopneustos together, God breathed, it tells us when the scripture is at work in your life, it doesn't matter what's happening in society around you. It doesn't matter if everything is coming unfolded and undone. As long as scripture is working in your life, 
it releases Theopneustos creative power in your life. If you don't like the smell in your life or the smell in your home, God's word will release the fragrance or the perfume of heaven into your life. If you will receive the word of God, it will change the smell that you don't like. And if you don't like the atmosphere of your home, God breathed scripture will release the music of heaven into your life. Can you say amen to that? So when he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, he is actually telling us that the scripture will bring creative power. It will bring a new fragrance. It will bring new music. It doesn't matter what's happening around us. God's word will bring these things into our life. And that is why he said in verse 14, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. But let's continue in verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, or all scripture is God breathed and is profitable for what? Doctrine, for reproof, and for? Everybody say correction. And just as an example, I want you to underline the word correction. The word correction is a specific Greek word which describes a man that has been knocked flat by the events of life. He's laying flat on his back. But the word correction, which is used here, means to take an individual and put him back upright on his feet again. So if you have been knocked flat by what's going on in the world, by taking the word of God into your life, it has the ability to pick you up and put you back on your feet again. Then he tells us in verse 17 that the man of God, that would be all of us, may be perfect or complete and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Everybody say thoroughly furnished. Thoroughly furnished is a very specific word. Now, I like these specific words because you can't make any mistake on these words. They only have one meaning, and therefore they only have one possible interpretation. Thoroughly furnished was used to describe a boat. Now, there were two kinds of boats. There was a simple boat, which didn't have much equipment. And because it didn't have much equipment, it wouldn't take you very far. You could go a little ways from the shore, but you would have to return to the shore. But you could take the same boat and you could thoroughly furnish it. You could give it a sail. You could give it oars. You could give it equipment. You could transform that simple boat with so much equipment that you could make it able for long-distance sailing. In fact, you could take that simple boat, and if you thoroughly furnish it, it can survive the biggest waves, and it can last through the worst storms, and can make it all the way to the other side. And that is the word which is used here, which means we are all simple believers, but depending on what we do with the Word of God depends on what kind of believers we become. We can be simple believers that don't have the faith or the equipment to make it very far. However, if we take the Holy Scriptures into our life, God's breath, His Scriptures, they will outfit us. They will give us a sail. They will give us oars. They will give us the equipment that we need to make it over every wave, to make it through all weather, and to become long-distance sailors. Can you say amen to that? So that we will make it all the way to the other side. And all of this is why he then says to Timothy and to me and to Pastor Mark in chapter 4, verse 1, verse 2, I charge you therefore, therefore, in light of the power of the word, the need of the word in these last times, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, do what? Preach the word. Don't substitute the word with motivational preaching. Don't substitute the word with psychological counseling. Preach the word. And it says, be instant. The word instant is the Greek word which means stay at your post, which means it's a military term which means the preaching of the word is the highest form of spiritual warfare that takes place. When the word of God is being preached, the Holy Spirit is working and he is waging war with his sword in the hearts 
in the souls of men. The word of God is the most powerful thing which God has given to us. I was thinking just today during worship, because Denise and I have been traveling around the United States, and we have seen trends change in the last 10 years. We were preaching in one church where I was preaching on Romans 8, verse 26. Have any of you ever heard me preach on Romans 8, verse 26? Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. It's quite a detailed teaching about the work of the Holy Spirit. Big church, great big church, wonderful worship, but it felt hollow. There was no sense of the Spirit of God in that place. Everything was professional. The music sounded wonderful. And when the service was over, Denise and I went up to the pastor's office. And we had been there for two nights, and he said, you know, I, I want to say something to you. And he said, I don't want to sound rude, but he said, you and Denise are kind of like somebody frozen in time. I said, really? What would that mean? He said, I think by moving to Russia, God preserved your life because the church in the Western world has moved on. He said, I can't remember when we've had Bible teaching like we've had it in our church this week. People just don't do that anymore. And as I was sitting today in worship in this church, listening to Pastor Mark take the offering, listening to the worship, and feeling such a sense of the Spirit of God in this church. I want to tell you that you are blessed to have the pastor that you have. And children's programs are wonderful, programs, 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 but if the Word of God is not strongly being declared, there is nothing for the Holy Spirit to confirm in a church. And you need to choose your church not just based on programs, but on the declaration and the proclamation of the Word of God, because that is what's going to equip the church for long-distance sailing in these times.